I own, why eternal punishment is not biblical. Most Christians today, certainly in the English-speaking world, think of eternal punishment as a critical church doctrine because most popular English Bible translations today use that very phrase, eternal punishment. But what you are not aware of is that phrase, eternal punishment, does not come out of the original language of the New Testament. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek. That phrase, eternal punishment, comes right out of Latin translations of the Bible. Eternal is the Latin word aeternum. That's where we get the word eternal from the Latin. It's pulled straight out of Latin translations of the Bible. It was not taken from the original Greek language of the Bible. What's actually in the Greek language is the Greek word ion and adjectives derived from ion. And ion merely means an age. 19th century classic scholar and linguist Frederick Farrar writes, ion, Hebrew olam, means properly an age, an indefinite period, long or short. The phrases which are asserted to imply endlessness are again and again use of things which have long since ceased to be. And Farrar is referring to the usage of the Greek word ion in the Septuagint and other classical Greek literature. In this presentation, I'm going to show why the Greek word ion and its derivatives and duplications do not mean eternal or forever, especially in relationship to punishment in the Bible. Now, earlier I did a presentation on this topic in response to a comment made by a pastor here at this channel. And I'm going to quote from him towards the end of this presentation. I'm going to leave him anonymous, but I'm going to quote from him because his reaction is very stereotypical. But first I want to start by quoting from some scholars who are experts in this area of classical Greek literature and hear what they say. Quoting from John Wesley Hansen's treatise on this topic, he writes, The oldest lexicographer, AD 400 to 600, defines Ion thus, The life of man, the time of life. At this early date, no theologian had yet imported into the word the meaning of endless duration. It retained only the sense it had in the classics and in the Bible. Hansen also records that a lexicographer from the 16th century named Favorinus was compelled to notice an addition which subsequently to the time of the famous Council of 544 had been grafted onto the word. He says, Ion, time, also life, also habit or way of life. Ion is also the eternal and the endless as it seems to the theologian. You see, Favorinus, this lexicographer Favorinus in the 16th century knew that that extra meaning was added onto the word by theologians sometime in the Middle Ages. And as I already pointed out, that meaning of eternity actually comes from the Latin. They translated the Greek word ion and its adjectives as aeternum in Latin Bibles, which were very popular, and changed the meaning of the word. Basically, this idea that Ion means eternity is a kind of circular reasoning going on with theologians in the Middle Ages. The Latin word aeternum means eternity. And so what they did is they assumed that that must be the meaning of the Greek word ion. They're taking the meaning of the Latin word and imposing it backward onto the Greek. But the Bible wasn't written in Latin originally. It was written in Koine Greek. And so it's the definition of the Greek word ion that we need to look at when we're translating the Bible into English, not what they did in the Latin. You see, the Greek word ion most closely resembles the word eon in English, which is in use by cosmologists and geologists, and it doesn't mean forever. Their usage of it denotes long time frames. And the original meaning of the Greek word ion, where we get our word eon or age, is that of a human lifespan, that the, the age of a human lifespan. So approximately a hundred years is how they viewed it. Regarding the definition of the Greek word ion, Dr. Edward Beecher remarks, it commonly means merely continuity of action. All attempts to set forth eternity as the original and primary sense of ion 
are at war with the facts of the Greek language for five centuries, in which it denoted life and its derivative senses, and the sense of eternity was unknown. And then Dr. Beecher went on to note that the classical authors outside the Bible, such as Homer or Herodotus, clearly understood that Ion meant a limited duration, roughly that of a human lifespan. The concept of eternity in Ion is nowhere to be found in classical Greek. Some have tried to claim that Ion in adjective form could mean eternity. Addressing that erroneous notion, a 19th century theologian quoted by John Wesley Hansen states the following, that Ionian does not mean endless or eternal may appear from considering that no adjective can have a greater force than the noun from which it is derived. If Ion means age, which none either will or can deny, then Ionian must mean age lasting or duration through the age or ages to which the thing spoken or relates. Confirming the same thing, 19th century classic scholar and linguist Frederick Farrar writes, since Ion meant an age, Ionius means properly belonging to an age or age long. And anyone who asserts that it must always mean endless defends a position that even Augustine practically abandoned 12 centuries ago. Even if Ion always meant eternity, which is not the case in either classical or Hellenistic Greek, Ionius could still only mean belonging to eternity, not lasting through it. Ionius does not even mean endless within the sphere of its own existence. Now, Farrar is an interesting theologian in that he didn't declare himself to be a universalist per se, but rather he held the position that universal reconciliation was God's intention and based on scripture was an outcome that we must consider. His point being that the adjective forms of Ion used throughout the New Testament to describe punishment could never mean eternity, even if the Greek word Ion could sometimes mean eternity based on the context. Farrar goes on to say, The word by itself, whether adjective or substantive, never means endless. Ionios may in some instances connote endlessness because it catches something of its color from the words to which it is joined. Just as the word indefinite might catch the sense of infinite if, in speaking of things which for other reasons I knew to be infinite in duration, I spoke of them as being of indefinite duration, it is a word which, like many other adjectives, shines simply by reflected light. So basically, Farrar is telling us that the idea of eternity can only be reflected back upon this adjective based on the context of the noun being described, such as if we were talking about God himself, the nature of God. But nothing about the noun punishment reflects eternity onto an adjective that merely means age, roughly the length of a human lifespan, especially if we are reading about a just God in the Bible. And Hansen goes on to note that there are plenty of Greek words and phrases that literally mean eternal or forever or endless. But the New Testament writers never employ those words to describe punishment. They just don't. Hansen writes, Some years since Reverend Ezra S. Goodwin patiently and candidly traced this word through the classics, finding the noun frequently in nearly all writers, but not meeting the adjective until Plato, its inventor, used it. He states, as the result of his protracted and exhaustive examination from the beginning down to Plato, we have the whole evidence of seven Greek writers extending through about six centuries down to the age of Plato who make use of the word Ion in common with other words, and no one of them ever employs it in the sense of eternity. Plato's use of the adjective Ionian clearly demonstrates he did not understand it as eternal. Plato describes certain souls as being in Ionian intoxication. And then he says, It is a very ancient opinion that souls quitting this world repair to the infernal regions and return after that to live in this world. So Plato, who had you know pagan ideas of the afterlife, viewed the word Ionian that he coined, that 
that adjective as souls go into Ionian intoxication and then they come back to this world. So it's a period of time and then they come back. So if Ion means forever, that would fly in the face of the uniform usage of the word and its adjectives in classical Greek literature. That would mean that this new meaning of Ion as eternity suddenly appeared in the New Testament out of nowhere. But referring to this doctrine of eternal punishment that we got out of the Latin, John Wesley Hansen remarks, a doctrine, if true, ought to crowd every sentence, frown in every line, only stated 14 times, and that too by a word whose uniform meaning everywhere else is limited to duration, the idea is preposterous. Such reticence is incredible. So Hansen in his treatise on the Greek word ion notes that there are plenty of Greek words and phrases such as ah, idios that mean endlessness, forever. But if a doctrine that is so important for us to understand, such as eternal punishment, were true, why in the world are they using this word that uniformly means a limited duration of time everywhere else in classical Greek writings? And even worse, the New Testament writers themselves demonstrate that is their understanding of this word and its adjectives. So back to this pastor who left a comment on one of my videos, a video, a short video I did, pointing out that that phrase in the book of Revelation, forever and ever, actually should be translated as in the age of ages. And he, he writes, sorry, this argument is based upon a literal word for word translation. Anyone who knows more than one language knows this is not how languages are translated. The term eyes, toes, Ionius, tone, Ionian, which the person in this video says should be translated as in the age of ages, is used in the following verses as forever and ever. If the term is only meant to refer to a limited time period, then you have to apply that translation, which would be temporal and limited, to the rest of the verses which that exact Greek construction appears. And of course, respectfully, I do appreciate this pastor being willing to stop by and make this challenge. And I want to respond to it. I'm glad he made the challenge because it gives me an opportunity to explain why that phrase in the book of Revelation should be translated as in the age of ages, which is what is literally in the Greek and not forever and ever. And so quoting from a verse that he posted as one of his examples that should be translated as forever and ever, he asserts, and there will no longer be any night and they will not have need of the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. Revelation 22, 5 in the NASB. So that sounds really nice. They reign forever and ever and we're used to seeing that. But as I previously pointed out, that idea is contradicted by the Apostle Paul. So as I previously pointed out, the Apostle Paul very specifically tells us that this age of ages that's translated as forever and ever in popular Bibles actually comes to an end. He writes, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So very specifically, Paul tells us that this reign, even Christ himself, only reigns until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And then he hands the kingdom over to his Father, who is unseen, that God may be all in all. In other words, mankind does not need a visible kingdom government forever and ever, only until all of Christ's enemies have been brought into submission before him. So Paul tells us that the culmination of this age of ages or ages of ages, this long time frame, at the end of this period of time, once Christ is completely victorious and all of his enemies have come into submission to him, then all dominion, authority, and power is abolished by Christ. The kingdom government, the visible kingdom government is no longer needed. Mankind doesn't need a babysitter forever and ever. At some point, we are all going to be connected with the Father, just like Christ is, and we're going to listen to the Father, and we all just do the right thing. And this is a beautiful thing that Paul is telling us, 
that at some point in time, mankind is going to live together in perfect harmony with each other and with the Father, and we don't need a government to keep us in line forever and ever. And I also pointed out that I own in these adjectives can't mean forever. If they did, that would mean Satan's kingdom is forever in Ephesians 2 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world, the Iona, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So very clearly this noun Iona does not mean forever and ever or eternity, because obviously Satan's kingdom is not for eternity. But the NASB and other popular Bible translations translate this exact same noun in Jude 1.13 as forever. They are wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever, Iona. So as I just pointed out, Obviously, Iona cannot mean forever in one passage, yet in the passage where punishment is, they translate it as forever. Obviously, this is absurd. Punishment does not reflect the idea of eternity back onto a word that means limit to duration everywhere else in classical Greek literature. So as these scholars pointed out, the idea of reflecting back the idea of eternity or forever on to a Greek word that doesn't mean forever everywhere else in Greek classical literature, that can only happen if something in the context really forces that understanding back onto the word. And I do give an example of this in Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And of course that word forever is into the ages. And that translation of forever is not the literal meaning of the word there, but the idea is there because of the nature of who Christ is. I could translate that same passage and say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So even if I use the word tomorrow, just like the word yesterday is in the passage, yesterday doesn't mean Jesus Christ was merely that way yesterday. It means Jesus was always that way. And if I use the word tomorrow, I would understand that means Jesus is always that way, tomorrow and tomorrow, because that is the nature of who Christ is, not because of the meaning of the word tomorrow or the meaning of the word yesterday in the passage. We understand this from the context of the passage that the nature of Christ is being reflected back on the word yesterday and the nature of Christ is being in the same way reflected back on the word tomorrow or in the case of the actual Greek, it's being reflected back on the Greek word ion. But that understanding is an extrapolation from the context who we're talking about, not the literal meaning of ion. Now, Hansen in his treatise on the Greek word ion notes that there are plenty of words that would strongly convey the idea of eternal punishment that were available to the New Testament writers, but they never employ them. And he notes that the Pharisees, who some of which believed in eternal punishment, and they got that concept coming out of Babylon. It's a you know in the book of Enoch and, and so forth. And Josephus writes that they, the Pharisees, believe that souls of the bad are allotted a adios erigmos, an eternal prison, and punish with a leptos temoria, eternal retribution. You see, the Greek word, for example, a adios literally means endless or eternal unless some limiting factor is placed upon it in the context of the passage whereas the greek word ion is completely the opposite it means a limited time frame and age unless some other context is reflecting back the meaning of eternity such as the nature of god or the nature of christ you see if the new testament writers wanted to convey the idea of eternal punishment it's not because the Greek language didn't have those words and phrases. Most certainly did, but they never employ them related to punishment. In one place, we see the word a adios, which literally means forever or eternal, used in the book of Jude, in Jude 1.6. But Jude puts a limiting factor on it and says that they are punished a adios, placed in prison until the judgment. You see what he did? So in that sense, he's saying it is perpetual unending until the judgment. And as I pointed out for at the beginning, this idea of eternal punishment comes from the Latin word aeternum. 
And it's the Latin manuscripts that gave us this idea of eternal punishment. The Greek word ion doesn't mean eternal. It's the Latin word aeternum that means eternal. But ironically, this concept of eternal punishment is even more forced upon us in English translations of the Bible than it even was in the Latin manuscripts. Because in the book of Revelation, the Latin manuscripts agree with me in the age of ages. You see, the Latin manuscripts translate the phrase Ionius ton Ionian as secula seculorum. In the Oxford Classical Dictionary, we have the definition of seculum. The seculum, defined as the longest span of human life, was fixed in the Republic as an era of 100 years. So this word seculum, used in the book of Revelation in the Latin manuscripts, closely matches the classical usage of the Greek word ion, roughly the length of a human lifetime. In Latin, they boiled it down to exactly 100 years, a seculum. And interestingly, John Wycliffe in the Wycliffe Bible that came before the King James, translating right out of the Latin, he translates that same phrase in Revelation as world of worlds. And somehow he's pulling that phrase from the Latin, secula seculorum. I suppose in a sense, a world that existed 100 years ago is now gone and over. Limited duration even in the Wycliffe translation. So where in the world did this idea of forever and ever punishment in the book of Revelation come from? Because it's not in the Latin and it's not in the Greek. It doesn't even appear in the Wycliffe Bible. So it appears that the King James translators just pulled that out of nowhere and coined that. But actually, that's not true. I know where they got it. They got it from William Tyndale. In the Tyndale Bible, that phrase, passage reads, shall be tormented day and night forevermore. So the King James translators actually got that from William Tyndale's phrase, forevermore. And William Tyndale has no precedent for that, but it came from William Tyndale, sadly. And most of the King James Bible is actually William Tyndale's work. Most people don't know that, but it's actually the work of one man, William Tyndale. But interestingly, in Old English, as we read in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, the word forever doesn't necessarily literally mean forever. They wrote, in the more lax sense, this word signifies continually for an indefinite period, you know, as his master shall bore his ear through with the all, and he shall serve him forever. Well, just for his lifetime, right? For his ion. So the question is, is when William Tyndale coined that phrase forevermore, that ended up being forever and ever in the King James translation, did William Tyndale mean that in the lax sense, like we see in Latin, the seculum being a human lifetime, or in Greek, the ion is a human lifetime. Did William Tyndale mean that in the lax sense? Because in Old English, it could have that meaning. But we may never know. I can't read his mind. But the idea of forever and ever punishment originates in English. It wasn't even in the Latin translations. And the Latin translations is where we got this concept of eternal punishment, where in other places they use that word, the Latin word aeternum, eternal, to refer to punishment. But even in the book of Revelation, the Latin doesn't force that upon us. It's only in English that this idea of forever and ever punishment is being forced upon us in translation. It's, it's worse for us today than it was even in the Dark Ages. So we need to understand that this concept of eternal punishment or forever and ever punishment is not biblical. It is not what the apostles wrote. It's not in the original language. I know there are the King James only people out there who tell me that the King James Bible is the true word of God in English. Now, I am not putting down the King James translation. The King James translation has done an enormous amount of good for Christians in the English speaking world. But the true word of God was not written in English. It was written in Greek, in Hebrew, in Aramaic. And these concepts of punishment in the New Testament to understand them, we do need to go back to the real Bible, to the Greek, and understand that this Greek word ion does not mean forever. It does not mean eternity. God's punishments are very specifically, in the Greek, temporary. God's punishments are corrective in nature and come to an end. In the New Testament, there are many adjectives that describe God's nature. 
but there are only three nouns that describe who God is. God is light, God is life, and God is love. Those are the only three nouns that describe who God is. Obviously, a God who tortures people for all eternity is not a God of light, is not a God of life, and is not a God of love. And that is why I am shining a bright light on this false doctrine of eternal punishment. I want you to see where it came from. I want you to understand that it is a false doctrine and should rightly be rejected by all Christians. Yes, the Bible does teach that God will punish evildoers, but it does not teach that God punishes people for all eternity. The word pictures being used in the Bible and the words being used to describe punishment are ideas like the refining of gold or the pruning back of a tree, corrective chastisement. God's punishments, just like everything else, are rooted in his nature of love and goodness and have a purpose in mind. Because God is light, God is life, and God is love. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. is its goal, punishment that has and accomplishes a worthwhile purpose. When punishment is described by these adjectives related to Ion, it is not automatically implying that punishment is even for an entire age, merely the idea of the quality and therefore effectiveness of the punishment, durable punishment, that brings forth a harvest of righteousness. But in any case, no matter how we interpret this, the core meaning of these adjectives derived from ion must be related to the original meaning of the noun, which is an age about the length of a human lifespan. Just like the adjective hourly must be related to the noun hour and not some other idea like eternity. In other words, if the New Testament writers actually wanted to describe eternity, they would need to use an adjective derived from a noun that means eternity, such as Ah, adios. Without that kind of specificity, the doctrine of eternal punishment is just wild speculation based on nothing. Just as John Wesley Hansen said, the idea is preposterous, such reticence is incredible. Now, a question that comes up a lot from people who are new to the doctrine of universal salvation is, well, if Ion doesn't mean eternity, then how do we know if we have eternal life? Well, it's important to understand that eternal life is not rooted in the Greek word ion or its adjectives, but rather eternal life is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. As the Apostle Paul tells us, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. This is why the Apostle Paul calls the resurrection of Jesus Christ the good news, the gospel. Because in Jesus Christ, all of mankind is raised into immortality that is rooted in the divine nature of God himself. For as long as Jesus Christ is alive, we are alive with him, and that is for all eternity. Now, I had an interesting visitor stop by my channel in response to my first video on Ion. 
He was an atheist linguist who is concerned that the doctrine of universal salvation might make Christianity more popular. He insisted that the Greek adjective Ionius has a strong sense of permanence and perpetual, and therefore we shouldn't abandon the doctrine of eternal punishment so readily. I quickly pointed out that even if true, the concept of permanence or perpetual is not the same as eternal. My house, for example, is permanent, but it's not eternal. But he is so certain that this Greek adjective really has a strong sense of being endless and perpetual and is as good as eternal, and he is putting up a $100 reward for every instance where Ionius can be shown to mean limited duration in deuterocanonical literature, the Greek translations of these ancient Hebrew texts. And so I quickly pointed out to him that classics scholar Frederick Farrar had noted that in very ancient cultures, the idea of eternity, something that is infinite, is actually too abstract in very ancient cultures. And they did not have any single word that could convey that idea. Farrar, quoting another scholar, wrote, the Hebrew was destitute of any single word to express endless duration. The pure idea of eternity is too abstract to have been conceived in the early ages of the world and accordingly is not found expressed by any word in ancient languages. So you see the problem my linguist friend here is facing. None of that literature conveys the idea of actual eternity or infinity in those words and therefore translating those passages with the Greek word Ionius cannot convey that meaning either if they translated that correctly. So I told my linguist friend that he could send his donation to St. Jude's Children Research Hospital since none of those passages could mean absolute endlessness. People in very ancient cultures, the very, very ancient Hebrew culture, they just did not think in abstract terms like infinity or eternity. For them, it just was long duration, far off, over the horizon, beyond sight. That's all it meant to them. Now, in all seriousness, I would like to take a moment to thank linguist Stuart James Felker for taking the time to enter into this discussion. He is an expert in linguistics, and he is speaking in his authority and giving his opinion as a linguist, whereas I am merely a researcher in this very narrow topic on the Greek word ion. So if you're listening, Stuart, thank you, my friend. And I suddenly realized after I had posted this original video that I understand the challenge that you are making. And I am an expert in this ancient doctrine of the apocatastasis. And I do have the answer to your challenge that there is an eschatological end to punishment in the New Testament, and that is part of your challenge. You see, Stuart actually does agree with me, and the experts I'm quoting in this presentation and my previous presentation, that Ionius does not literally mean eternity. Stuart is merely asserting that it has a strong sense of permanence unless something outside interrupts that permanence. At his blog, Stuart wrote, there's a specific reason I've tried to emphasize that I understand Ionius mainly to denote permanence. What I don't mean here is that everything that was described as Ionius was expected to, say, genuinely last forever. Instead, what I mean for Ionius as suggesting permanence is something like lasting the greatest amount of time that could possibly transpire within a given situation or system. So that is a very different idea than eternity. Permanence and eternity are actually completely different ideas. They are, well, infinitely different. And so what Stuart is challenging me to do is show that there is an eschatological end to punishment in the New Testament. And I can show that. And if you've watched videos at my channel, you would see that I have shown that over and over. You can start by watching my presentation on the Lake of Fire here at this channel. You see, early church fathers, uh, such as Origen of Alexandria, native speakers of Koine Greek, understood the Lake of Fire to mean a refiner's crucible, the refining of gold. 
And it does point to an eschatological end of punishment because the gold refining process is not eternal. Also, you can start by considering Matthew 25, 46. The origin of the word translated as punishment, colazo, is punishment with a purpose and goal in mind. It means corrective chastisement, the pruning back of a tree. You don't impose corrective punishment unless the punishment is expected to come to an end, an eschatological end punishment. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul specifically tells us that this era of punishment does come to an eschatological end and that at a certain point, all of Christ's enemies are brought to his feet in submission. And at this point in time, Christ hands the kingdom over to his Father that God may be all in all. Paul wrote, Then the end comes when he will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he will have abolished all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And Paul explains that it is at this point that Christ hands the kingdom off to his Father who is unseen, that God may be all in all. You see, it is this passage where the name of my channel, The Total Victory of Christ, comes from. This is describing the total victory of Christ. Christ isn't crushing his enemies. He's bringing them into submission before him, into submission to his kingship. You see, Christ isn't forcing people onto his knees like a tyrant. These people are willingly submitting themselves and bowing before him in worship. You see, the God of love isn't a tyrant who just senselessly tortures people. His punishments are designed to school people, to teach people. You see what I'm saying, Stuart? This is the eschatological end of punishment in the New Testament, when the last enemy has been brought into worship, into the submission, into confessing that Jesus is Lord at the end of this age of ages. So just to recap, Stuart himself does not believe that the Greek word Ionius actually means eternity. And I don't believe that it means eternity either. And this is because I have it on good authority from some very prominent scholars, including patristic scholar Loria Ramelli, who tells us that this word really never meant eternity to them. And I do want to reassert that eternal life is not rooted in the Greek word ion. It was never rooted in the Greek word ion. Remember, eternal life is rooted in the nature of Jesus Christ himself. In the resurrection we have with him, we are raised with Christ into incorruptibility and immortality as the Apostle Paul taught. It is the nature of Jesus Christ, the divine nature of God himself, that brings eternal life. We are raised with him, therefore as long as Jesus Christ is alive, we are alive because we are raised in the power of his resurrection. Okay, just finishing up here, and to summarize, to understand the meaning of any adjective, the assumption is that you understand the meaning of the noun it is derived from. Just as if I said hourly, you would understand that is derived from the noun hour, and that it means a short increment of time. In the same way, the adjectives Ionius, Ionian, is derived from the noun Ion, and it assumes that you understand that Ion means an age, a limited duration of time. Also, adjectives often carry the secondary shade of meaning related to the quality of the noun being described. Just as if I said, George is very timely, what am I saying? I'm taking the noun time and using the adjective timely, and it reflects the idea that George is a very reliable person. He is timely. Also, if I take the noun duration and use the word durable to describe my truck, I have a durable truck, what am I saying? I'm saying that this is a truck that was built to last. It is a high quality truck. In the same way, the Greek adjectives Ionian and Ionius, derived from the noun Ion, has a secondary shade of meaning related to the quality of the life to come. And that idea is documented by lexicographers. And that is something that we need to consider when looking at these passages as well. 
Therefore, even if you could make the case that ion in these adjectives literally means eternity, which is not the case, but if you could make that case, you still have to consider that secondary shade of meaning related to the adjective, that it's referring to the quality of the life to come and the effectiveness of the punishment in the life to come, and not literally referring to duration at all. Just as 19th century classic scholar and linguist Frederick Farrar says, these adjectives shine simply by reflected light based on the context of the passage. So if we want to get back to what the original Christians believe and take that final step in the Christian Reformation movement, then we need to embrace one more very important concept. Jesus Christ is the savior of the whole world. Jesus Christ loved mankind unconditionally at the cross. And as Christians, we need to do the same to the best of our ability and love people unconditionally. We are to be a light to the world in a city on the hill, reflecting God's love for all mankind and sharing the good news that Jesus Christ is indeed the savior of the whole world. God bless you and thank you for listening.